All right, let's open our Bibles tonight. Acts chapter 20, verse 29, as we continue our study through the Bible. And, and right now, we're in the book of Acts. So, chapter 20, verse 29. Just to set the stage for you, Paul is headed back to Jerusalem, hoping to get there, according to verse 16 of chapter 20, by the Pentecost, which gives him really 50 days from when he made that desire and that, that statement of desire there in, in Greece. And... He wanted to get there for a couple of reasons. Number one, he hadn't been there in a while. He loved Jerusalem, loved the people, knew a lot of them, obviously, in the church. But also because for the manyth time, we're not really sure how many, but certainly several times, Paul had gathered monies from the Gentile churches to help the poor in Jerusalem, not only because he loved them and felt he owed them, having caused such havoc for them for years, but also, you know, being that apostle of grace in many ways, Paul wanted to bridge the gap between the the Gentile churches, the believers, and the Jewish saints. And that wasn't an easy transition early on in the church. There was certainly you know, some difficulty, and which is why the Lord gives us such, such a, a, an amount of insight when Peter is finally sent to Cornelius' house. You get you know, the build-up. You get to all of the, the, the things coming together as the Lord just makes sure that everyone knows that it's his work. So a lot of these folks where Paul had planted churches now sent emissaries, representatives with the offerings from these various churches, to hand over to James and the church in Jerusalem. Well, Paul was thinking about, after being in Ephesus, getting there, but first he wanted to go through Troas and Macedonia and Philippi and Thessalonica down to to Greece, to Athens, to to Berea, if you will, to Corinth. And, And he stayed there for three months or so before deciding it was time to go, and he got to the port city there in Greece, and he thought, well, I'll just get on a boat and sail over to Syria, which would then allow him to go south to Jerusalem, but they found out that there was a plot to kill him, and he was smart enough not to get on the boat. He kind of went back, if you have a map, the way that he came, until he worked his way around with these men to Miletus, which was one of the port cities in Asia, about 12 miles or so, 13 miles from Ephesus, which was the big city in the area, where Paul had spent three years on that last trip, in fact, before he'd made that little swing around north and then south. So, in a hurry, because he you know, didn't have that many days left to get to Jerusalem, he called the elders to himself. And he asked if they might just not come and see him there. These are men that he had trained and discipled, maybe hired, certainly had ordained some, had watched God raise them up as pastors in the flock, and men whom he truly believed he would never see again. He was pretty sure that, that, that all the warnings that he'd been getting along the road was going to lead him to just, you know, probably never get back here. And so, It was a very heartfelt meeting that Paul wanted to leave the best that he had with him to give him words that meant something and and that he didn't, you know, there was no time to beat around the bush or give these long, you know, speeches or anything. He he just wanted to to warn them and to to encourage them and and he was in a hurry. And so the the men come to the port city and and Paul gives to them these words of directions that, that take up verses 18 through 38 and have taken up our last two weeks and tonight we will finish them. But they're so important to hear, not only for all of us as far as what the church should be like, but for those in ministry who believe that God has called them to oversee the spiritual well-being of others, to the elders. And we've gone pretty slowly. We looked at verses 18 through 21 where Paul talked a lot about his own personal example. You've seen me in every season. You've seen me in humility. You've seen me in tears. You've seen me publicly and privately through trials without and within testifying of of who Jesus is and how we need to follow him by faith. He begins in verse 22, which we looked at last week, tell them not to be moved by the difficulties, or he wasn't, by the, by the, the warnings that were coming his way, that he was glad that he had left them the full counsel of God's word, that he had left nothing out. And he ended, and we ended last week in verse 28, where Paul said to these men, so you should take heed to yourself. And we talked a lot about elders and those in ministry, for, you know, the best way you can prepare yourself is to be selfish in your spiritual well-being. Take care of yourself. You know, get right with God. Stay close to the Lord. Learn his word. Let it fill your heart constantly. And then take care of the flock, which the Lord has given you, made you an overseer by the Holy Spirit, to, to shepherd, to feed, to pastor, to oversee, to encourage the flock, which he, the Lord, has purchased with his own blood. Great verse that speaks of the trinity or the triunity of God the Godhead, if you will, of Jesus being God. But Paul's intention was just to get them to focus clearly upon their, their, their responsibility for themselves and then for the saints in that order. 
and that they, were, that they were caring for someone that didn't belong to them, it belonged to the Lord. He purchased them. So we spent two weeks looking at that. If you weren't here and you'd like to listen to the CDs or the DVDs, we have them all available. Uh, most of the time, the week after the church services, we have them online as well. So you can just listen to them there or the podcast or whatever. So tonight, we would like to conclude his words to these men that he loved before he was leaving. Uh, let's go back to verse... Um, 17, and we'll just kind of read up to the place that we're at tonight. From Miletus he sent to, the F, to Ephesus, called for the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourself, and to all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer, that you shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, Paul says in verse 29, that after my departing, savage Wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul warned the church that these leaders should always keep an eye out on the fact that there are those outside of the church as wolves, savage wolves, he calls them. And shepherds and pastors and overseers should always, I think, be aware of what is happening in the world around them. You know, there are a, 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 any number of cults and and new doctrines floating around all the time. The internet, as good as it is, can really be destructive in that regard, you know? People can develop followings on just the weirdest of ideas, and the latest wind of doctrine, and the, and the trends that go. And one of the responsibility of a shepherd, if he's watching sheep, is to keep an eye on the fields, you know, to be sure that the uh, flock is cared for, and that they're well protected. Certainly any good shepherd would check the canyons for wolves in hiding before bringing his flocks into graze. And there are dangers constantly to be found outside of the church walls. Paul's description of them as savage wolves, the word savage means unmerciful or unsparing. Folks that are not interested in the sheep, they're interested in themselves. They want to destroy the sheep or devour the flock. And there are any number of, of ministries or so, ministries so-called today that would like nothing more than to enlist you and have you follow after them. Paul knew for sure that these false teachers would come in from among or from outside, but come in among the, the flock, and their interest was not to spare the flock, but to bless themselves. The Bible teaches that one of Satan's greatest ploys, that, that wherever God begins to sow wheat, he seeks to plant tares among the wheat. Wheat and tares, if you've ever seen them growing together, look almost identical. You really can't distinguish them by, by looking at them until they begin to bear fruit. And when one is a very black and ugly and, and obviously wrong, you know, in the midst of the, the beautiful white wheat. So there, there is this rottenness that comes within the church, but it, it is planted there from without. Jesus said to the disciples there in the Sermon on the Mount, you beware of false prophets because they'll come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they're like ravenous wolves, almost the same wording that Paul used. He, he warned us about them. And later, in, in sending the, the, the disciples out on that training mission there in, Ma, uh, in Matthew 10, the Lord said to them, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so you should be wise as serpents while you be harmless as doves. It, it's a pretty good picture, I think, of the battle that you enter into for the hearts of men and a real image of what you're up against when the Lord describes the battle that the church often faces uh, as being sheep among wolves. The sheep usually don't stand a chance among a bunch of wolves. But the good thing is we have a shepherd who is much bigger than the, the wolves. And so the shepherd who watches for himself and then cares for the flock, verse 28, should also keep an eye on what is coming 
at the sheep to try to destroy them. Certainly the best way you can distinguish what you're facing is to know the Bible really well. You know, there are groups that want to teach you um, cultic books or, 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 or aberrant teachings, and they'll say, well, learn this book. And I've always been one that thought, you know, the Bible's big enough for me to learn. I think I'll spend my time there. If I'm going to know how to witness to a Mormon, I really don't need to study the Book of Mormon. I really don't care what it says. I really want to tell them what God says. I don't need to study the pearls of you know, great price or the Book of Covenants and with a Jehovah Witness. I don't need those things. If I know the Bible, all those things stick out pretty well. You know, better that I just feed myself in the Scriptures so that you know, I know what, what the Lord says and then I can be wise to the doctrine that the wolf might be spreading. You know, the wolf has a different diet than the sheep. The sheep, they eat straw and hay. <laughs> the wolf eats sheep. So when he comes to fleece and not to feed and to take and not to give and to feed his flesh and not his, your spirit, then we can pretty well go, now there's a wolf. There's someone that is out to destroy the people of God. And, and the elders are encouraged, not just here, but in many places in the scriptures, to be watchful and careful Later, when Timothy would be sent here to pastor, Paul would write to him in chapter 4 of his first letter, as, as Timothy took over the Ephesian church, he said, Now, Timothy, you know that the Spirit has expressly said that in the last days there would be some who would depart from the faith and they would give heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, who would speak lies in hypocrisy. They would have their own conscience seared with a hot iron. They would tell you you couldn't get married. They would command you to abstain from certain food which God has created that with thanksgiving you should receive. Be careful. Instruct the brethren, he said, in these things. You'll be a good minister of Jesus. You'll nourish them in the words of faith and in good doctrine. And you're following it, they'll follow it. You, you teach the people to be careful about the things that lurk outside seducing spirits, doctrines of demons, and they are always floating around the church. And it's interesting to me, I don't know if it's just because of the West Coast progressiveness, but most false doctrines tend to start here. And five years later, they show up in, you know, in Detroit, and in New York. We'll, we'll talk to pastors on the East Coast that we know, and we'll say, have you been dealing with this at all? They go, no, we didn't even hear that. Oh, yeah, it's coming. It tends to blow with the wind, I think. I don't, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know... I, I've seen folks, even from our church, unfortunately, get caught up in particular movements as if somehow they have found a new gospel. And, and they're so excited, you know. I'm glad it's just been a few, and, and, and I hope that it's because, you know, they're taught well and, and you're not going to get caught up so easily. And we pray for God's protection, but, you know, the tear sowers are everywhere. Guys who want to offer you, you know, peace without submission to the Lord and, and, and wealth without you know, devotion or, or, or love for things, you know, they want to call wealth faith, and there's just so much weird stuff that goes on, and, and it's constantly being sold to folks, and they, they grab onto it, you know. The churches in our area that are growing the most are not churches that have you bring a Bible to church. Now, they will tell you how great the worship is and how wonderful the movement is, but I, I must tell you, when, when we started here in church, there was a church in town that had 3,000 people in it that was kind of of that ilk. And they're gone. 25 years later, they don't exist. 3,000 people to zero. But, but it's only because they weren't bothering to teach the Bible. They, they had a lot of hooks, and, and people like hooks. But, you know, if, if you want to get hooked, go fishing. Don't be the fish. Be careful. And I thank the Lord that he, he guides and leads us. When, when Peter, you know, wrote his, his first epistle, or no, no, his second epistle, second Peter, he, he, he started in chapter 2, and he spent the entire chapter talking about false prophets. And, and he said, you know, there will always be false prophets among the people. Even as there were false teachers among you, they secretly bring in destructive heresies. They deny the Lord that bought them. They bring swift destruction upon themselves. Because of their destructive ways, many will follow them, and because of them, the way of truth is being blasphemed. In other words, their example so turns the hearts of people against God that when the truth comes, they won't hear it. By, covetous, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words, and their judgment is not but idle, and their destruction does not summer. God knows. And Paul was very concerned for the Ephesian church. When I leave, and he was a pretty strong guy, I think he, he kept the, 
you know, the, the church in check in many ways, if you will, in that regard. But when he, he left, he said, I know that there will be some of you that will be caught up. Forty years later, it was the Ephesian church who had left their first love, but the Lord said, I've got this uh, uh, with you, or I agree with you in this, I hate those deeds of the Nicolaitans. You, you didn't bring that priesthood into the church. Um, I, I know you're, 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 you're against that, and so am I. There were churches that were doing well in that regard. Others had fallen victims to the, wor- to the, to the wolves. Smyrna was battling. Pergamus was stumbling. Thyatira was falling. All for doctrinal issues. Gathering to themselves truths that weren't truths at all but that they had embraced in their culture and were being taught by the people. So Paul w- watches and he warns the church that the battle is inevitable and you've got to fight the fight. You know? you gotta, and, and the best way you can do it is to know the truth of God, which I think in verse 28, Paul goes, you take care of yourself first. You be sure you're strong. Then you feed the people so that when the wolves come in, they won't really have much to chew on because nobody's really going with the wolf. Hi, I listened to what you said. You're a wolf. Well, come out to dinner with me. No, no, no. I don't want to be your dinner. So, Paul was faithful to do so. And he warned them. In fact, he says in verse 31, remember for three years I have warned you. So Paul was very interested that they understood from without, not from within the church, but outside of the church, come those who ingratiate themselves to us. Second of all, in verse 30, also from among yourselves, men will rise up and they will speak perverse things and draw away the disciples after themselves. More than one false prophet has gotten their start in the church. You know, more than one weird movement has begun with a foothold in the church. And the purpose of these men who gather themselves in the church is to get a following. They come into the body of Christ to develop themselves. Paul had established this church. He had trained its leaders. Timothy was sent here by him because he had been there with him to pastor them. And yet... This rising up from within still took place by those who had their own agenda. There were still wolves in Paul's church, in Timothy's fellowship. When Paul, a a few years ago, or a few years ago, a few years afterwards, more than a few years ago, um, wrote 1 Timothy chapter 1, he, he said to Timothy, as I encouraged you when I went into Macedonia that you remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that were teaching no other doctrine, don't give heed to fables or endless genealogies, which have caused disputes rather than godly unification. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, sincere faith, which some, have, having strayed, have turned to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, but understanding neither what they say nor the things that they affirm. He, he encouraged Timothy to be careful. When Paul was about to be killed in prison, he wrote one last letter to Timothy, just one final word to this pastor of this church that he so loved. And he said in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, Uh, Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, Timothy, a worker that doesn't need to be ashamed that you rightly divide the word of truth. But you shun, Timothy, profane and idle babblings which only lead to more ungodliness and their message spreads like cancer. And watch out for that fellow Hymenius and that fellow Philetus. They are of that sort. They stray concerning the truth. They say the resurrection's already passed. They overthrow The faith of some, nevertheless, the solid foundation that God stands upon has this seal. The Lord knows that are his, those who are his. But Paul warned Timothy, even about a couple guys in this Ephesian church who had been nothing but trouble for years and were continuing to to frustrate and and to divide and to to hurt the church. When Paul wrote in in 2 Timothy, that last letter in chapter 3, he said there are those who have a form of godliness but they deny God's power, turn away from those men. These are the kind of folks who creep into households and make captive gullible women loaded with sin, led away by their lusts, always learning, never able coming to the knowledge of the truth. And so Paul says uh, they'll progress no further. Be careful. Pay attention to the doctrine and manner of life and purpose and faith and love and perseverance and long-suffering that you've learned. Don't just sell out. Don't, Don't buy in. Because this is the way that the church is opposed. From without, they come to draw you away. And from within, they come to sit with you and then grow. And then, in the meantime, begin to sow those seeds of discord and and begin to draw men after themselves. And it happens. It happens. 
as a point of interest, and I'll just mention it to you from the standpoint of maybe you've thought about it, Paul, in dealing with specific false teachers in a local church, identifies them by name. He doesn't do that in a general sense. He's not good at throwing names around of people in the culture that may be fitting that problem. Um, But when it comes to the local Ephesian church and there's people that they've been dealing with for a long time, Paul does mention them by name. He doesn't do that generally. And I mention that because um, when I was first a pastor, I used to get so angry with some of these TV evangelist guys, and I would just name them. And I would say, we have seen this guy on the TV. Here's what he said last night. And it would just irk me. And I realized that it probably isn't my position to point out a guy I don't know at all other than what I know that he's teaching. And I think if I teach you the Bible well, you'll listen to what he's teaching and go, yeah, that's not right. I don't really need to name him. He, you know, he'll stand or fall before the Lord. So I'm, I'm real careful not to do that. It's just, just something I'm not comfortable with. I think folks who do it risk uh, stepping on the hands of those that God may be using, even though they're way out of line. Uh, better that I just teach the Word of God. And, and that's pretty solid, and that's pretty dependable, and then there's no real need for me to go, have you listened to this guy on the radio? I've seen this guy on the TV. Um, So I try to stay away from that. There are times when I stumble. (laughs) I was close to it this evening. (laughs) There's been some stupid books written lately and sold to churches, but, uh, you know, God knows. Just learn your Bible and and understand that, 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 you know, the church is a safe place to be as far as growing, but it's not a safe place. The enemy wants to come in and infiltrate People from without want to take you out. And uh, there's all kinds of folks out there like that. You wouldn't believe the amount of radio phone calls we'll get if we're teaching a Bible verse somewhere and, and these, these guys that are involved in whatever little movement it is will begin to call. Well, did you know and did you believe it? I heard the pastor and that's not right. And you, you know, they've got their little agenda. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. But yet, you know, the Bible's pretty straightforward and, and, and pretty clear. I don't think that we... We have to, like, scratch our heads and wonder. But there is always going to be that contention, you know. When Jude sat down to write his little letter towards the back of your Bible, he began by saying, I wanted to sit down and just diligently write to you about our common salvation. He really wanted to write a a, a fun letter of, aren't we blessed, you know. Let's talk about all the good things we have in common. But he said, as he began to write, I found it necessary to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in, unnoticed, long ago marked out for their condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness, deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jude spent his entire letter going, watch out for these guys. They live in our midst, you know. They come from without. <clears throat> he said in chapter, <coughs> Jude, chapter, chapter 1, there's only one chapter. Uh, in verse 12, Jude said this, he said, they, they are spots in your love feast. They feast with you without fear, while they serve only themselves. They are clouds, but they have no water. They're carried about by the wind. They're like late autumn trees that have no fruit. They're twice dead. They're plucked up by the roots. They're raging waves of the seas. They're foaming up their own shame. They're wandering stars reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Jude said they're in the church, so be careful. There are a lot of folks that call themselves Christians that will pull away people to themselves, and yet... They will lead you astray. You know, Absalom sat outside his father's gate for years as he chided David's leadership. And all he said to the people was, well, if I was ruling, if I was the king, here's what I would do. And people went, oh, we're going to follow you. But, you know, that wasn't where the Lord wanted the people to go. The word perverse things here in our scripture means to twist the scriptures, to suit their purposes. And their purpose is defined here in verse 30. They want to draw men after themselves. So, We've seen three or four folks over the years, <clears throat> some of them leave 40 or 50 at a time, you know, someone, uh, you know, a good leader, a guy with, you know, personality, and he talks good, will we'll be in church for a while, get people to know him and like him and develop friends, and then they'll begin to question our leadership or our way of doing things, and, hey, you know, we're going to go, we're going to go we're to a place, you know, where God can really move, and, you with me? Oh, yeah. And there they go. And we've seen them go, and some come back, and others just go. I I just see it as blessed subtraction. Thank you, Lord. 
no more trouble. But, you know, they always use the words, well, God is leading us, and God has shown us, and God's just moving, not with you, with us. <laughs> and it can be a danger. We have, you know, seen in other fellowships overseers who desire big crowds, and they don't want to just stick with teaching the Bible and let God have his way, so they change their purpose to more palatable things, and, and they appeal more to the flesh and their attendance, and they lower biblical expectations just a bit. Um, there was a very large church here in Southern California recently who had Tony Blair come speak. Well, I, I, I you know, respect him as a political guy from Britain, but he's not saved. And, and I personally could never stick someone in the pulpit that wasn't saved. You know, hey, he's a great baseball player. Wonderful. Go play baseball. This is church. You know, I have a little sign up here which says, Sir, we would see Jesus. Because that's really why we're here. Right? John 12, 21. Sir, we would see Jesus. So you can begin to just be, you know, turned and twisted. And people go, oh, you know, this guy was here. And that guy came to speak to us. And sure, I'm sure that you can gather people together. But, you know, you're not called to to preach messages that people want to hear. You're called to preach messages that God wants to have spoken. You know, you, you can't just preach positive confession and draw them to big crystal cathedrals. You've got to teach them the Bible. And God will honor his word. He always has. He always will. There is a huge secular movement or secular church movement in the seeker-friendly emerging church area today where there is a lot of hemming and hawing about doctrine. In fact, probably you know, emerging sounds almost right because they really don't know what they believe themselves. They're still emerging. But what they know for sure is they don't believe that the Bible teaches anything in absolute terms. So they would rather have a conversation with you about sin or or sensuality, or, well, you know, everybody's different, we've got to make room, and, and, and they just have undermined the Scriptures and don't believe that the Bible speaks in absolutes. And so, you know, there are thousands upon thousands, especially college kids that get caught up in these um, Internet kind of churches with huge kind of productions, but, but what's being taught will not feed them uh, at all. Uh, I, I have a friend who was an elder in a church out of the state who watched the pastor decide that one of his board members, who they wanted to put on their board, was a business guy that was very good at real estate because they were looking to buy a building. And so they put this guy on, and he said, I said to the pastor, you know, this guy's just been saved like eight weeks. Probably not a good place for him. Maybe he just ought to sit in church and let the Lord be blessing him. You know, you don't need to use this guy. Oh, just believe God's going to use him. And it just went really bad. And now the fellow's not in church at all. They had some disagreements. Oh, that's the way you're going to be trying to use it. Oh, I get it now. You know, you guys are all the same. And he went out the door. You, you, can't, you, can't, um, you can't compromise with what God's called us to do. You know, if you want scholarship in the pulpit or you want bragging rights about the education of your pastor, if the issue becomes that rather than spiritual qualifications, you're in trouble. Um, I, I spoke at a... A, a Southern Baptist church a couple of years ago, and they had a big argument about whether I should speak there or not because I don't have a seminary degree. And they said, well, you we don't really, you know, he doesn't have a seminary degree. <laughs> so I said, well, I don't think Peter did either. But I can smell a fish. And, and, and ah, they like that, but not too much. And, and <laughs> <coughs> they finally agreed to let me come speak, and, you know, it was, it was fine. God blessed his word like he usually does, but or as he always does. But it's an, interesting, it's an interesting danger because within the church, you know, there's always the temptation to get away from the scriptures, to align yourself with the dissenter or align yourself with some new doctrine or align yourself with some new practice that makes life easier for you. But it sets the Bible aside. Take heed to yourself. Uh, Paul said to the elders, don't you get caught up in this. You, you feed yourself and you feed the flock. They're his people. The wolves are outside and the wolves are inside. Be careful. And, and Paul made a big deal of it. He said in verse 31, you should just be watchful. <clears throat> Keep an eye out. Remember, for three years I didn't cease to warn every one of you night and day with tears. We had uh, several years ago a group get caught up in, in, a, in a thing called Momentos. It was a, uh, an Eckhard seminar thing up out of Northern California. It was a you know, sit around in the mountains and 
contemplate your navel kind of deal. But, oh, it's the best, man. You spend the weekend there, you don't eat, you just sit around, wow, it's so awesome. Really? And that's what you're going to do? Oh, yeah. And what would they want money-wise for you? Oh, it's only $400 a person for the weekend. Really? Yeah, and you get to, oh. I said, dude, stop. And we had a fellow in church that was paying for people to go, and I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, you don't stop it. I'm going to tell everyone from the pulpit who you are. You can't go hustling the people out to a mountaintop for 800 bucks. All right, we're leaving. And 40 people walked out the door with him. 35 came back. There's no more momentum in the momentous that died. But it came and it went, and you have to kind of keep an eye out, you know. So Paul said to watch. And, and for three years, Paul had been very vigilant to guard the flock. You know, from Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares, once the tares are rooted, they're hard to get out. Remember the disciples said, Lord, let us run in there and pull up the tares. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. If you pull up the tares, you're going you're gonna to damage some of the wheat. You just let them grow together, and then I will separate them when the time comes. But, you know, we, we don't want to allow that to grow in our midst. So Paul said, you watch, and then you remember what example I have been for you these last three years. Remember what I've taught you. Remember what you've learned. I always find that <clears throat> maybe it's just me, because I go from one Bible study to the other. Um, I, I, I thought, I looked at last year, I taught 361 times last year. That's more than once a day, right? I'm pretty sure. No, it's not. I'm four short. <laughs> I knew I was slacking. Well, you do five a week here, and then there's always places to go teach and get a lot of calls and stuff, and that's fun. I love it. I like being able to share what God has given to me. Um, but it's really easy when you're always in church to forget what you're learning, right? You're off to learn. Give me something else. Give me something else. <laughs> like if I said to you, what's in Acts 16? Would you even know? Don't look. I know. See that? That was only nine weeks ago. Nine weeks ago. So I'm only good for like four weeks. Can you remember? See, it, there's something to be said for, for learning what we learn and letting it become a part of our lives. Watch, remember, and then warn, Paul said. And that was the big deal. And the, the word warn here is a great Greek word. The, the word is nuthetic. And it literally means to admonish, to correct behavior using the scriptures. It, it is probably the only biblical counseling approach that the Bible teaches. Nuthesis. It means to, to counsel with the word of God. And Paul said, I, I took the Bible to you firmly, gently, correctly, constantly, so that you were able to be taught. He warned by correction, he'd warned by admonishment. He was firm, but he was kind. He was moved to tears. Not everybody listened. Some people fell prey to the, to the wolves. Um, we actually had a couple, I think when we first started back in, the late, in, in 80, oh, I think it was probably 88 or 89, th there was a tremendous movement in the church for the second time on being slain in the spirit. And, and, you know, people would want to come forward. And, and, and the churches all over, the, even our area, they'd lay hands on you and fall down, you know. And, oh, the Lord is moving. And I used to go to these things, and i go, what is it going on? And they go, the Lord is moving. I go, no, that's not the Lord. The Lord wouldn't knock you down. Seriously? So I, I, I got my Bible out, and I went to the pastor. and said, you know, the only place you find people getting knocked down is, A, when the Lord's filled the place and no one can get in, and, B, when, when God wants to prove to you who he is, and you're an enemy. And I mentioned to him about, you know, them coming to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I said, that's not biblical. The Lord's not knocking you down. Come on, buddy, that's a show. And then you, how hard do you have to push? And, 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 and you know, are you convincing everyone and, and getting them ready to fall over? It was just a joke. So I, I went to the guy personally. thought I could convince him, and he told me I just needed to repent. And, All right. <laughs> I tried. Um, but it was so weird, you know, and so we had a couple that were in our church, and they said, look, we'd like to have slaying in the spirit on Sunday nights, and I said, well, there's a church up the street you can go to, but we're not going that route, you know, we, we want the Lord to lift you up, and if you happen to fall down under the power of God's spirit at home, God bless you, I'm glad if the Lord fell on you like that, but it ain't going to happen with me putting my hand on your head in front of an audience, you know, just not going to work here. And they were mad at me, and then I'd go to the market, and I, you know, this lady was involved in the market, and then the, the people at the market would look at me funny, like she'd been talking about me. What's wrong? Well, you know, you don't follow the Bible. Really? Which Bible is that exactly? And you just catch, hey, you know. Uh, Paul said, warn. You don't want to become wolf food. 
And I remember that woman saying to me as she left the door, you're quenching the spirit. Okay. That's pretty much my goal. Um, Warn, remember, watch. Because without warning, we become fat sheep ready for the slaughter. And Paul was like a father, you know. He, he, he hurts over those who want to stray. Verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all of those who are being sanctified. So there's his answer, right? How do you prepare people for the wolves? You teach them the word of God. Commit them to the Word of God. And Paul's final signing off before some personal notes here at the end is to say to these elders, let me just commend you to God's Word. If you teach that, you're fine. Your people will be fine. They will be protected. You can rest. They'll be fine. There is no substitute for committing them to the Lord. No substitute at all. I I thank the Lord that God has given to us a hunger for his word. I commend you to his grace, which is able to build you up. I commit you to that. And Paul um, was really sold on teaching the Bible. I know that in, in many ways, it seems like the obvious answer, doesn't it? I mean, it's God's word, tells us about God's son and God's life that he wants to give us. It tells us about heaven and hell and and life as we know it, you would think everyone would go, yeah, that's what we need to learn. We need to learn from the Lord. And and most folks, when they get saved, they're very hungry to be taught the Bible. But there does come a, a, I don't know, a a hill somewhere in your spiritual growth where that becomes a battle. You know, maybe it's familiarity, maybe it's I've heard it before, maybe it's, you know, I I just don't see the fruit coming so fast, so I don't quite commit myself to it as much. But but yet, the, the, the Bible tells us that his word builds us up. Right? That, that if you're in it, and, and I'm singing to the choir, because most of you are here every week, and you're faithful to come, and, and you're going through the Bible, and I, I, I don't doubt you're going to come out the other end blessed. But, but like milk, you know, Peter said, the word of God will cause us to grow. And you have the foundation, Jesus has come to dwell in your heart, but now you need, you know, the building upon it. And so Paul, as he says to these elders about warning and and caring for themselves and being careful for the flock, said, look, just stick with the scriptures. Stick with the grace of God. It'll build you up. And it'll give you an inheritance, the kind that all of us are waiting for, those who've been set apart are going to get. Well, finally then, beginning in verse 33, Paul speaks about a couple of things and his view on on things that that, that are his example but but affect ministry, and, and, and in particular his view of temporal gain. He says in verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands <clears throat> have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and that you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So Paul, in, in, in finishing his little ministry talk with them, speaks to them about the pastor and gain or money. It's certainly a vital topic, I think, in every culture because of the abuses that you see. You know, the Jim Bakers and all the things that you've seen on the television, people shake their heads. And now, at least when that whole 700 Club thing, not the 700 Club, when when his little group fell apart, you know, we had the hardest time getting people to church because they'd always say, oh, you're just after my money. And it would really undermine the work that, that was being done. Paul after three years in Ephesus, points again to his example and said, now you guys know that I I ministered without covetousness. I I worked hard with my hands. I worked hard to provide an income for the folks who were with me. I wanted to minister freely. I didn't want to be a a burden. I wanted to be a witness. Covetousness is, is pretty much typical to man. You know, if there's a way our flesh can get things working so it profits us, we usually like to go in that direction. But... Paul's warning to the overseers is you can't really um, minister and, and, and do very well unless your eyes are upon the eternal. Fancy things come with curses, you know? And Paul was free, and he wanted the folks that he was serving to be free. Jesus said he couldn't serve two masters, and Paul said, no, I just want to serve the one. Uh, we have people sometimes call the church bands, speakers, 
ministries that blow across the country, and they'll, they'll say, hey, we'd really, we really believe the Lord would have us come speak at your church. And I always like these calls. And so I say, well, how did you come convinced that it was our church that you had to come to? Well, we hear you on the radio, so we know the Lord's moving. Interpretation, you have money to pay us. <laughs> and so I'll say, well, great, why don't you send a tape, a CD, you know, we'll pass along to the folks and we'll pray about it and see if the Lord wants us to invite you. And then they'll say this, well, what kind of money will you pay us? And I said, oh, I don't know, we have to pray about that, you know. And, oh, well, we, we'd like, to, you know, to have this much money and, and we need to have this many rooms and we need to have a place to sell our goods and, and they'll give you a whole list. So as you're praying, here's some things we need. And you get the feeling after a couple of minutes, they're not here to love you, but they'd love you to love them. And if we get on phone calls like that, those folks never show up. In fact, we have a list we keep here of folks that have called like that, just in case they call later and change their voice. <laughs> Paul would do anything for anyone at any time for nothing. My God shall supply all of your needs, he said. And I love it. We, we have tried to practice that in our administration of the church. We um, try to do things as inexpensively as possible. All of the money that the bookstore makes um, goes to support the radio. Our radio budget is around $400,000 a year. Uh, the bookstore raises about 35 or 40% of that. Um, God has blessed greatly. And, and we, we, we run our retreats that you go on just so we break even. We don't want to make five cents. We just want you to be able to go and be blessed. There's no sense making money for those kind of things. We trust if, if God wants us to have income, income will come and we won't have to worry about it. Um, the books that I've written and my wife writes as far as the Bible studies here are all signed over to the church. We never see a penny of it. It all goes back to the church. We write them here. We figure they belong to you and not to me. So um, we don't speak in the body much about money because we've never needed any. God has just always paid our bills. I, I'm sure that he will continue. I think if he wouldn't, I'd quit, only because you don't want to serve a God that you have to beg for. He could really use your help. Really? Yeah, that's the God I want to serve. Um, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Bible says he'll add everything to us. Do, does the church have needs? We do. We need a bigger building. We need a buyer for our place. We've actually had a guy buy the place and then not buy the place in the last six weeks. That was pretty good. I got it. I'll take it. No, I'm not going to take it. <laughs> His elders talked him out of it. It was a pastor from uh, Pico Rivera that was doing well and is growing. Lovely man, loves the Lord. But, and his church is growing, but they just think it's too far for the congregation to come. And I can't really argue the point. But um, We're still looking for a place to go. Um, and I guess in God's timing, it'll work out. Do we have bills? we got all kinds of bills. You should see our bills. You should see our air conditioning bill, electric bill. They're huge. I think the electric company bills us, and then they all get together and laugh. <laughs> Send this to the church. That'd be great. There you go. And the staff of people that do a lot of work. Do we worry about paying them? God has always faithfully taken care of the church. And, and I love Paul's attitude. I, I'm not in it for the dough. It's a good thing, right? I've not coveted anyone's silver. I'm not in it for the dough. You've got to be in it for the Lord or you're not going to be in it at all. And, and Paul lived it out. And, and I love that he quotes Jesus' words here because we don't have those in the gospel. Better to give than to receive. We have other things that, that equiv you know, are equal to that, but those specific words, I don't know that we read those in the gospels. But Paul lived by them. It's better to give than to receive. Better to, to serve others than to serve myself. And, and Paul worked every day to provide for himself and his team and for the weak. And, and Jesus' words motivated him. It, it's hard to find fault with the way Paul handled finances. And I think, you know, the worldview of the church and, and certainly of Jesus is often flavored by the way churches behave themselves. Um, our bank, or the bank we're looking to borrow money from if we build, um, looked at our last couple of years of, of income statements and all, and and the bank guy called me and he said, I've never seen a church so clean. And we said, well, what do you mean clean? Well, everything's accounted for, everything's right. And, well, yeah, it's a church, man. What do you think? You know, what are we supposed to do? And he said, you're in better shape than, than any church we've ever seen. How good is that? You know, that honors the Lord, right? Rather than the fiascos that you see on television 
with the constant fundraisers painting a different portrait than a god of plenty. Um, <laughs> and like Paul saying to the guys, you remember how I did it, now you do it. You know, don't get out of line. Well, finally, verse 36, when he had said these things, they knelt down and they prayed with all of them and they wept freely and they fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him and they sorrowed most of all for the words which he spoke that they wouldn't see his face anymore. And then they accompanied him to the ship. So they stayed to wave goodbye to the boat from the shore. We love you, Paul. He'd made a lot of friends in Ephesus. I, I don't doubt that the elders went back to Ephesus vowing they were going to do better. You know, and uh, may we leave here vowing to be these same kind of believers. Next week, we will be in Israel. We will be there for two Sundays. In fact, you'll have a lot of guest speakers. I hope you like them. If you don't, send me a note. I don't know what I'll do with it, but send me a note. But after we get back, we'll start in chapter 21 and head out from there. Father, we thank you tonight for uh, the blessing of your word, for the, for the great words that you've given to us and to the elders here in Ephesus. May, may they resonate with us. May they, may they find a place in our hearts as we think about them and as you allow us to, to just meditate on your word. That, that Lord, certainly will be committed to you, will We'll, we'll feed and, and we'll lead, we'll watch and we'll warn, we'll pray and we'll study. We'll not be driven by any self-interest or gain when it comes to serving you. And that we'll watch out for those who would try to make us uh, their dinner. Wolves who would like to feast upon us and use us. May we rather put ourselves in places where we can serve you with great joy. Thank you, Lord, for the church that you've built. Thank you for the, the blessings that you've brought. Tonight, as we sit before you, may you help us to always be those men and women that would honor the Lord and bring honor to his name, especially in this world where the aberrations and the perversions of the scriptures are, are, are so successful with people but that there's no life to be found there. Jesus isn't honored. He isn't blessed. If tonight you need prayer or, or just... Maybe give your life to the Lord. Maybe you haven't surrendered to Him. The pastors will be up front. We'd love to pray with you. And then we'd love to invite you to dinner afterwards. You come pray and, and ask the Lord to be the Lord of your life. And then come and have fellowship over in the fellowship hall. Have a meal with us. And may the Lord bless you as you begin your walk with Him. So simple, isn't it? To walk with God. And so, so muddled when the wolves seek to come in and use us and take us and devour us. May we commit ourselves to the word of God and be safe in it. We pray.